Galatians, to me, kind of gets summed up in the very beginning of it because Paul says grace and peace to you. He really kind of words it just slightly different than that. But, but the point he's trying to make in uh, really in verses 2 and 3 is, is that we need to remember this gospel that we were given. And I hope that as we go through this study, it'll be something that will help that. But I want to talk today a little bit about why Galatians. Andrew and I had talked about it several times. I talked about it last year when we went through Hebrews, but I'm kind of a, I guess, uh, the easiest way for me to stay centered in the gospel is just to pick a book, preach through that book, and then move to the next book. I think when you get topical, too often you end up with this statement, I feel like. And you don't need to know what I feel like. Not when it comes to Scripture's application. You need to know what God said. And we can talk about application with some feelings involved. But not in meaning. Not in determined theological understanding of what it is that the Word says. It says what it says. And it means what it means. It only has one meaning. Thousands of applications. But if I start getting too topical, it'll become something where it's too easy to want scriptures to fit your topic. And you go and you find those scriptures. And we call that cherry picking of scripture. You've probably heard that used before. But ultimately what you'll do is you'll build an argument out of random scriptures that didn't make your argument. They just fit what you wanted to cover that day. So it's important that we, for me, that I stay here. I'm not smart enough to go into too much topical stuff. as I'll end up way off base and so will you. So it's important that we stay right where we are. Plus, for me, when I'm looking at books, then it's like, okay, God, what book? What do we pray through? What do we, what do we preach through this year? Really kept going back and forth. Galatians wasn't in the top two that I was at in December. But ultimately, the more we look around our culture, I think there are a lot of aspects of what we're dealing with in the world that if Paul was writing us a letter, it might be very much like Galatians. Because you have to understand that the tenor, the, the attitude that he brings to the writing of this book, even though he does his normal little salutation at the beginning, it's pretty brief because he wants to get to the point really quickly. And his point is, why have you moved away from the gospel which you were taught? You've so quickly abandoned that. And in the world we live in today, where we just really don't like anything that's concrete truth, what we see is, even in believers, we are moving away from the gospel we were taught. The other part of it is because, with Paul particularly, I have an affinity for him because he had a late-in-life conversion. And I had a late-in-life conversion. And I love the stories of people that have grown up in church and they've lived in church all their life. They've experienced Christ through most of their life. They've made very minimal diversions from that. And I love that. I love hearing about this stalwart, consistent faith in people's lives. And I'm envious of the fact that I didn't grow up with that in my house. That we didn't pray over meals. We didn't talk about Jesus. We didn't worry about those things. Occasionally, on a whim, we would attend a, a, some sort of Christmas Eve service or something else, but it was never a major part of my life. So I envy the fact, now as a saved person, that many of you got to grow up your entire life with Christ being a central figure in your life. I envy that. It's a great gift that you don't quite probably honor the way you should. Because there were things that you got to escape. There are grand testimonies about life life conversion, and they're wonderful. They really are. But they always come with a tremendous amount of scars. Don't uh, belittle your testimony because you got to grow up in the Lord. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. On the flip side of that, 
What I notice an awful lot of times with people that grew up in the Lord is that you forget how powerful he can change things. You've never experienced it. You might have heard about it in a testimony, but you've not experienced it. You've not had your life go from dark to light. You've not seen where he can take something going so far and so fast away from him and stop it dead and turn it around. I know that because so often we doubt that God can change the things that are going on in our lives in a church. We worship a God of change. We were dead in our transgressions and we are now alive. Why would we want to abandon that God for something else? And Paul expresses that in the book of Galatians. Why have you so quickly turned, is his plea at the very beginning. It's kind of a reminder of that tale of two cities. You know, Charles Dickens' Tale of Two Cities, the letter to Galatians could have been given a really similar title. Paul's tale, however, is very factual, not fictional, and warns us of the two Gospels being heard in Galatia and still being heard today which is the gospel and then the gospel plus. You have the gospel, which is preached by Paul, by Peter even, especially after he's confronted. We'll talk about that a little bit in this book as well. But the simplicity of the gospel just wasn't enough for several Jewish believers. There had to be more than that. You had to still be circumcised. You still had to have observed the law. You still had to apply these things. In the church today, we might define it differently than that. It might be, well, you still need to dress this particular way. You still need to walk this particular way. You still need to use this type of language or that type of music or this translation. It's the gospel plus. And Paul's trying to combat that in the book of Galatians. He's trying to help us understand and believe that the gospel is enough. The death of Christ was enough to forgive your sins and to restore you to God. To save your life, all you need is the gospel. You don't need the gospel plus. why he starts out defending himself a little bit. Galatians 1.1, Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Judaizers were who he was combating mainly. These people taught that a Christian must also live as a Jew. The law and works were still required of them. If you've ever read any commentary on the epistles, you've likely seen that word Judaizers. Their main contention was usually circumcision. But that was simply an opening salvo. They usually used that to get you to believe that you started to need to believe this law. Now they could add other laws to that. Same thing that had happened to them. We begin with circumcision as a sign of the covenant between Abraham and God, and the next thing you know, we have 660-some laws that are requirements. That contention of circumcision was simply a salvo. But they obviously, we still deal with this because in our current culture in the United States of America, the reason why we have instituted circumcision immediately after childbirth in most instances is because of Christian roots that were in our culture at the time they stay now we characterize them different we say it's for all kinds of different medical reasons but it grew out of a Puritan culture that started this country a Puritan culture that had much adopted the Judaizers viewpoint in the way that we needed to live out the law along with the gospel still deal with it today we still fight it today this Option for the gospel plus. 
Freedom in Christ has always been scary and never more scary than it is to religious people. The idea that people might be free in Christ scares me to death because it means that my son or my daughter can choose things apart from what I would have them to choose and they could still be in Christ. I want them to walk this path, this small aisle right down the center. That's where I want them to walk. I don't want them to diverge much from this or that. I want them to go this way. So as a result, I end up, if I'm not careful, applying the gospel plus. Keep your hair this length. Don't get tattoos. Don't pierce your ears. Don't walk this way. Don't wear that skirt that short. The gospel plus. Circumcision is just a salvo, and oftentimes our beginning rules are just an opening salvo. Galatians 2.14 says, But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, If you, through a, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? And he talks about how he confronts Cephas. Peter, see who that is. He confronts him. They call this the Antioch Incident. The Antioch Incident is where Paul says to Peter, you're doing this wrong. You're acting like a Jew when Jews are around. But when they're not around, you're teaching something completely different and you can't do that. The gospel is the gospel regardless of who the audience is. It's a great point of scripture and a great point for a pastor to remember. But that's why he has to defend himself here a little bit in 1-1. Give clarification to who he is, how he came to be. Because the Judaizers that were coming around were trying to kind of discredit him and, and try to paint like this was a person who was just being sent by men and he was giving them a wrong gospel. And he says, oh no, uh uh. The Damascus Road incident was my conversion and my teaching came directly from the Lord. I have authority here. And he's trying to establish the fact so that they'll listen to him. He's establishing the fact so we'll listen to him. In modern day senses, it might be very much like me trying to make sure not only reaffirm for myself, but for you, the authority as a pastor. In the fact that God calls me out of nothing. I was certainly not looking to come here and be the pastor of this church. But he unanimously first convinces Carmen and I that this is the direction we need to go. Then convinces the search committee unanimously that this is the direction that we need to go. Then convinces a congregation unanimously that this is the direction we need to go. Paul, in this instance, is making that type of an assertion. I am here because God told me to be here. And I have preached to you the gospel that God gave me. And that's what he's trying to tell them. To the point he believes this so ardently that he confronts Peter. And corrects his wrong thinking. This Antioch incident closely surrounds an event called the Jerusalem Council. And the Jerusalem Council is when all of the early church leaders gathered together to decide whether or not circumcision should be required of the Gentiles. Because there was a faction that thought that there should be and that the law should still be applied. So they have this argument. And ultimately they decide this. This is part of that argument. It says, after there had been much debate, Peter stood up. Peter... Cephas, who was corrected earlier by Paul, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, and that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God now knows the heart, bore the witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us, and he made no distinction between them and us. 
having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, just as they will. So this corrected Peter then stands up and makes the same case before the Jerusalem council that Paul had made to him. You couldn't live as a Jew. Why are you placing that yoke upon believers in Christ? And Peter makes the same argument. Validating in lots of ways the authority that Paul claims in his writing. They ultimately conclude this, Therefore my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, and from what has been strangled, and from blood. So why do they write that part? There's still some rules that are applied there. Well, that's because they're talking about cultural distinctions. Things that they're supposed to do that set them apart from the world around them. Not requirements of salvation. Ways we can display light. Ways we can introduce salt. Ways we can be different than the world around us. You have to have CQ to do that. In ministry, you need kind of three Q levels. IQ, you need to be smart enough to read and understand. You need EQ, which means you need to be able to recognize your own emotions and the emotions of other people. And you need to have CQ, which means you can recognize the difference between your culture and somebody else's. And that you don't always apply everything that you believe into someone else's culture because they don't believe it. So it's important that you have those three things. For instance, I remember reading about a missionary that went to China. His wife made a joke about him in front of some people and they never again gained an audience with that particular village because in that culture it's unheard of for a wife to make fun of her husband didn't have cultural intelligence ruined the opportunity to do that certainly no that's not true in our culture (laughs) Carmen can make jokes about me all day I can make jokes about her sometimes but Freedom in Christ, though, like I said, has always been scary, and particularly when it comes to cultural differences. I don't like telling anybody they're wrong any more than anybody else likes telling somebody they're wrong. And I certainly don't like doing something that will intentionally offend someone. But there are cultural distinctions that we need to display in our lives that will put us at odds with the world that's around us. Now, what each one of those is changes from place to place at times. But we still have to have cultural distinctions. That's why some people try to say, well, James and Paul disagree with one another because Paul Paul says, you know, freedom in Christ. And James says, wait a minute, we still have to obey the law and the works of the law. But the difference is cultural distinction, and they both say the same things. When you read Romans 12, 2, it says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. In that instance, he's saying, don't be like the world around you. Do something different than they do. Be transformed by the power of Christ. And let that show to the people around us. There will be cultural distinctions between us and them. And if there isn't, we need to quickly and thoroughly evaluate why. And be willing to meet that with a critical eye. James 19 through 27 says, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness and the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror, For he looks at himself, but then goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. 
If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. These passages are not about law, they're about distinction. How can someone recognize the difference between you as a believer and themselves as an unbeliever? If there is no distinction, why would they believe what you are telling them to believe? It's like driving a Ford trying to talk someone in to driving a Chevy. <laughs> we do it though. Look, Christ will set you free. He will forgive you from your sins. You will have joy and peace. Pay no attention to the fact that I am miserable and complaining all the time. That I can't seem to find a good word to say about anybody. Don't pay any attention to that. The fact that I drive a Ford has nothing to do with the fact that you should drive a Chevy. We quickly abandon the gospel that saved us. We want others to come to a faith that will change their lives with no evidence that it has changed ours. How will they know? The central verse to me of this whole book is this verse, and we'll come back to it multiple times. Yet we know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. But because, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. An adherence to a group of rules will not be what saves us. One of the greatest things to me about following Jesus Christ, about Him being my Lord and Savior, is that the only thing I need on a certificate at the gates of heaven is His name. I need nothing else. The simplicity of the gospel. So then how can we be saved? Well, first... We believe on the Son of God. John 14, 1 says, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. We believe in Jesus Christ and who he says he is. That he is the Son of God. Put forth to pay the price for our sins. He gives us his righteousness and takes upon himself our sin. We need to acknowledge our sin. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We have all sinned. All of us. We are not saved by attendance records. We're not saved by tithing records. We're not saved by small group involvement. We're not saved by any of those things. We are saved by the glory of God through the forgiveness of sins, through His Son. We have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We will not make it on our own merit. We won't. But John, 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we repent, if we acknowledge our sin, if we ask for forgiveness, we will be Forgiven. Romans 5 8 tells us that God showed his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While I was still sinful, Christ died for me. Now I just have to surrender my life to Jesus as Lord. And then Romans 10 10 says, For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and saved. I, love the fact that he put it in this order because of the fact that we need to believe this in our hearts before anything we say out of our mouths will matter 
And too often we want our words to mean more than our heart and our actions. And it just won't. The simplicity of the gospel is if I believe Jesus in my heart, confess him with my mouth, I will, I might, with my mouth I will be saved. I surrender my life to him as Lord. And then Ephesians 2.8 tells us, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing, not of your own works. It is the gift of God. The simplicity of the gospel allows Paul to say to them, grace and peace to you. Because what we need is grace extended by God that can restore the peace between us and him. You need the gospel. And not the gospel plus. And Paul is trying very hard to help us to see that fact in the book of Galatians. There are cultural distinctions that should tell us apart from us to the world. But don't confuse those for steps to salvation. They may be steps to evangelism, but they are not steps to salvation. We had a conversation in a car on the way to Morgantown a week or so ago. The person with me said, I feel so guilty about some of the things I should be doing more of and the things I should be living it out more of. And I would encourage you to understand that there's a certain healthy aspect of that. First off, unsaved people don't worry about what God thinks about their lives. <laughs> they don't. So there's some solace in the fact that you even wrestle with this fact. But the other part of it is, is we have to understand that because of the simplicity of the gospel, your salvation is sure. What you are working on now is your witness. And your witness matters. And it has weight. And that's why you feel conviction because of it. You are not in danger of losing your salvation. You're in danger of being a bad witness the simplicity of the gospel. Work on your witness. Work out your salvation, Paul calls it. Live different. Be different. Remember God changes things. And if he didn't change it for you, no one's going to believe that it will change for them. Nothing in my life is the same as it was before I met Jesus Christ. Nothing. How much different has he made yours? Start sharing that with people. They want to know how to be different too. 